Keith Sprower, Chief Investment Officer here at Global Wealth Advisors, and this is the outlook for the fourth quarter of 2024. If we start by looking at the performance of the various asset classes through the end of the third quarter, we can see that it's been a very good year to date. With the fourth quarter still left to go, we have seen double digit returns in all of the equity asset classes tracked here. Large cap has performed the best so far, returning a little over 22%. Fixed income is well into positive territory with rates coming down from recent highs. The hypothetical balanced portfolio that has a target of 60% equity and 40% fixed income has returned a little over 12% for the first three quarters of the year. This is a bit remarkable given how much volatility we've seen globally. As we will discuss, the concern for some investors revolves around hitting these new highs and seeing valuations stretched, the constantly talked about but never realized recession, and so on. But unless something substantial changes, we should see back-to-back -back good years in the market. Some of the things that have been helping on the equity side have to do with earnings. As you can see here, post-COVID numbers around profitable companies based on earnings has normalized to a great extent. You can see by the chart on the left that the percentage of unprofitable companies has come down substantially. You'd expect that there would be a certain number of unprofitable companies in the small cap or the smaller company space, but even they are on the decline. The chart on the right is very important as it shows that the earnings growth of the Magnificent Seven has come down, but the other 493 stocks as a group have increased earnings, meaning that good performance is broadening out across the S&P 500 and not solely on a handful of stocks. The S&P 500 continues to hit all-time highs. So far this year, there have been 43 new highs that have been made, and importantly, about a third of these new highs have become the new floors. The graph on the left shows this ratcheting up higher and higher. Now, I find the graph on the right interesting because the way I read it, it shows the importance of keeping money in the market. What we're looking at is different time periods and someone who puts money in on any given day versus putting money in at an all-time high. A lot of people will hesitate to put money in when the market is fully priced, expecting and waiting for a pullback. What the data here is telling us is that investing at those high levels gets you better performance. Think about this year specifically. If you had invested at the second high of the year, there still would have been 41 more highs to come. Not surprisingly, uh, the decent earnings and the market continuing up has caused a new round of bullish projections by strategists who are taking the S&P up to 6,000 by year end. Just some things to keep in mind. It is also important to look at the technical side of analysis. On this slide, we are looking at price trends of the U.S. large cap market and the global large and mid cap markets. The slide on the left is tracking the S&P 500 here. The 200-day moving average is rising more than 70% of the time, certainly a positive trend. The graph on the right is the all-country world index, XUS, so without the USA. And this includes developed countries and developing countries with large and mid-cap companies. It has struggled a bit to retain the same trend profile as the S&P 500, and we wouldn't expect it to, but it's moving in the right direction. As we saw from the year-to-date performance page, emerging markets are up 17% and international is up 13% for the year. A few comments on the fixed income markets before getting into some of what's going on with the economy. We've lived through a few tough years of fixed income performance while the Fed was rapidly increasing rates to curb inflation. And this is a nice slide that overlays various yield curves at various dates. And it's fascinating to me anyway, is, is really where we were before all this started. The line or curve on August of 2020 shows where yields were along the maturity spectrum. And at that time, we had a 30-year treasury yielding a little over 1%. A few years later, October of 23, we were over 5%. 
And I believe going through the pain of the poor performance will give us return in the years to come. We've seen this a bit last year and are seeing this some this year as well. One of the things I don't believe anymore, at least this time around, is that an inverted yield curve, where the short-term rates are yielding more than long-term rates, is a predictor of a coming recession. It's apparent that we went from a normal-shaped curve, albeit flat, in 2020, to where we are today, which is the dark blue line there. And it shows that there are only a few of the shortest maturities that need to come down to normalize the curve again. And throughout this whole time, we only saw a recession for a few months in the spring of 2020. I'm not saying there won't be ups and downs and that the uh, economic data won't be volatile and the markets won't be volatile. But as we sit today, there is no strong sign of a recession. If you're looking for the latest information on financial planning and investment management, check out our blog at gwadvisors.net backslash blog. You'll find informative articles on retirement readiness, risk management, asset allocation, estate planning, and business succession. You can also join over 10,000 listeners every other week for some witty banter on the Your Money Momentum podcast. Listen in at gwadvisors.net backslash podcast. And remember, you can always get your questions answered by emailing us at info at gwadvisors.net. We're here to help you succeed. One of the more important economic stories that happened in the third quarter, but will affect the quarters to come, is that the Federal Reserve cut rates. It's been a long road to get there. If you recall, the Fed began hiking in March of 2022. Before that, the Fed funds range was zero to a quarter of percent. They hiked 525 basis points or five and a quarter percent from March of 22 to July of 23. And then they paused until this cut of a half a percent or 50 basis points in September, just a few weeks ago. As you can see from the chart on the left, they don't expect to stop anytime soon. As I've spoken about in the past, the Federal Reserve historically runs in cycles, whether it's hiking, pausing, or cutting, and they have just begun the cutting cycle. They feel they've done enough to slow down inflation to close to their target of 2%, and they believe that a 2% price index personal consumption expenditure, or PCE, will put the economy in a good place for both price stability and full employment, which is their mandates. So with this rate cut, they're saying that they're comfortable with where inflation is now, or at least how it's trending, and they want to focus on the employment side of their mandate. According to the projections that came out after the September meeting, shown here on the left, they will cut uh, 50 more basis points this year, likely 25 at the November meeting, and the same at the December meeting, uh, which will be the next time that we see the new projections. Then it looks like another 1% worth of cuts next year and another half a percent of cuts in 2026. On the right chart, you can see that if it plays out as they expect, they will achieve their economic goals by the end of 2026. I think there are a few big factors that will prevent that path from playing out, which would mean we should expect volatility in the markets as they readjust to new realities. The first factor is that the vote to cut 50 basis points wasn't unanimous. There was one member voting against it and other members that voiced their opinion for 25 basis points versus the 50 basis points cut, but in the end went along with 50 basis points. The other point to make is I don't think trend growth as measured by GDP is 2% or 1.8% anymore. I think it's going to be higher than that. And as I'll point out as we go forward, the economy remains in good shape, even with a bit of softening. The reasons for the Fed cuts is to be supportive of the economy over time and to get the last bit of the inverted yield curve back in line. Let's check in on some of the important higher frequency economic data. On the left is the Federal Reserve's estimate for real GDP using the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now predictor, and it's showing an October estimate 
for the third quarter of 3.2% and shows that we had 3% GDP in the second quarter. There have been misses on GDP projections and revisions upward. The fourth quarter of last year, if you recall, was supposed to be around 1%. It was much higher. Q1 of this year was a bit soft, but we've been in a pretty good place since. The other graph is the Fed's favorite inflation indicator, as we have discussed in the past, the PCE, which as the last print was 2.24, two and a quarter percent. That's going to be close to the 2% target. So I can see why they felt that it's mission accomplished uh, on their inflation mandate. Of the important pieces of economic data that are talked about a lot, the other one is the employment picture. The U.S. unemployment rate was 4.2% in August and dropped a bit to 4.1% in September. This plus an unexpectedly big payroll number is causing some to guess that the 50 basis point cut may have been a little too much. I think the graph on the right is very telling. We've been fighting the supply and demand dynamic of the jobs market for a few years now. And what we're looking at here is a favorite chart of Chairman Powell's, the supply of workers in the labor force in blue, and the red is the labor demand as measured by household employment plus job openings. As you can see, we're about as close to equilibrium uh, as we have been in quite a while. There is one asterisk, I would say, to, to much of the employment data, and that is the impact of foreign born workers. They've been impactful in the lower income, lower skilled jobs, but I've yet to see any definitive numbers around how many workers there are. As we start to wrap up, I don't see big changes to my outlook over the next few quarters, and the base case hasn't changed. I will say as a caution, and that's if we do continue to add performance through the end of the year in the various asset classes, it could be pulling some performance forward from 2025. In that case, I think we would have high single digit equity performance next year, and the fixed income markets would return mid single digit performance depending on the path of the Fed. That in no way means you should be out of the market or stay mostly in ultra short fixed income or cash because those yields are starting to price lower as the realities of the Fed cuts are coming. Lastly is the headwinds and tailwind slide. On the headwind side, there has been a significant escalation in the war in the Middle East. It doesn't seem to me that there is anyone who is willing to really push for peace. So we are in this volley of attack and retaliate while slowly bringing other countries into it. And though it hasn't really affected our markets or our economy to date, there could be a shock to the system if we begin to see issues with the oil supply. And I think it would be a significant change if the U.S got meaningfully involved. The dynamics are very dangerous and it's likely that the longer it continues, uh, the more chance mistakes will be made. The upcoming elections could be something, it could be nothing with regards to investments. Both parties will be spending and increasing the deficit and the debt. Both parties will keep the tax cuts in place with the possible exception of the higher earners. As far as social strife is concerned, I think that the only way it's really going to go smooth is if there is a clear winner via the Electoral College and the winner also takes the popular vote. As mentioned, either way, the debt and deficit will continue to grow, which in the past has preceded trouble. It's just impossible to tell how long that will take and what it'll look like exactly, so there's not much to do specifically regarding portfolio management. On the tailwind side, it's continued productivity, economic growth, earnings growth are both ongoing. Not only our central bank, but global central banks are moving into an easing phase. We saw this big recently with China using both fiscal and monetary policy to jumpstart their economy. From everyone at Global Wealth Advisors, thanks for listening. 
And if you like this content, please consider following us on the social media below. And I'll speak with you next quarter. Thank you.